data count rail two. And you went to Poland, Peter, in forty-four. That, that's right. Well, sometime in the middle of August, nineteen forty-four, I was on holiday in the West Country, uh, at the borders of Devon and Cornwall, and expecting to enjoy three or four weeks of holiday when I got a telephone call from Perks in London saying, come back at once. So I did, and I was told that he was organising a mission to drop into Warsaw, the Warsaw Rising under General Borkomorowski. began, I think I'm right in saying, on the 1st of August. And uh, Perks had got authority to send a mission in to the Poles in Warsaw, and it was to be commanded by Colonel Bill Hudson, and with him was Peter Solly Flood, um, Alan Morgan, who, alas, I heard uh, the other day died of cancer, um, Alan Morgan and myself, and a, 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 a wireless operator, um, Sergeant Major Galbraith. Uh, the, um, we sat around for a while in London learning our one-time letter pads, which we were going to use as, as code, but we waited and waited and waited, and Perks told us that Stalin was strongly opposed to any mission being sent to what he called those bandits, uh, the Poles. He, his own armies, under his orders, as you know, were sitting five miles east of Warsaw at the time and could have given enormous help to the uh, freedom fighters in, in, of, of Bor um Armia Krajowa. But being Stalin, he didn't, because he wanted the Poles to get destroyed by the Germans and then to take over Poland. Hmm. Can, can I just ask yes. you, uh, Perks was... Uh, um, Colonel Perkins. Colonel Perkins. Did, oh, did, I thought you knew Perks. You must know. Anyway, um, sorry, but Colonel Harold Perkins, who had been on the first British mission to Poland in 1939 with, with General Gubbins. And was the head of the... And was head of the Polish section in SOE. In, that's right. And... To go back, uh, anyway, uh, Stalin uh, strongly objected, and the Foreign Office, then presided over by Anthony Eden, who seemed to have an obsessive admiration for Stalin and uh, unwilling to refuse him anything, the Foreign Office would not let us go. And this went on for quite a long time until finally... There was a change of government among the... a change in the Polish government in London, and the previous Prime Minister, Mikołajczyk, resigned and uh, in favour of Archiszewski, who is a Polish socialist, much more anti-Russian, in fact, than Mikołajczyk had been. But I think by that time with pressure from Lord Selborne, who was the minister responsible, uh, uh, cabinet minister responsible for SOE. He was also minister of economic warfare. Under pressure from Lord Selborne and General Gubbins and, of course, Perkins, uh, eventually it was decided that we should go whether Stalin liked it or not. And so we took off for Italy and we were based, uh, we were going to fly in from Brindisi. It was a long flight but uh, it was the only possibility because we'd had our aircraft, the RAF had had such terrible losses flying to the Poles from England that in the end, the, um, I suppose it was the chiefs of staff decided that that was no longer practicable. The Germans had a night fighter belt, I remember, over Denmark, which caused enormous casualties. Stalin, of course, would not allow the Air Force to use his airfields which would have solved the problem completely. Uh, so we went to Brindisi, and we were quartered in some trulli, those funny beehive-like houses in Apulia, uh, just above Monopoly. And we waited and waited and waited. And this time our problems were, were not political but weather, because when the weather was good north of the Carpathians, over our dropping zone, it was lousy around Brindisi. It was a six, wait a minute, five, no, six-hour flight, I think I'm right in saying, each way. And we had two ghastly journeys, 
total of tw nearly 12 hours inside the unheated belly of a liberator. And each time we had to come back because the weather over the dropping zone was so foggy that we couldn't see the, the f flares on the target area. But eventually, uh, in December, we uh, took or we uh, were able to drop. And of course it was very, it was bitterly cold, the ground was hard and covered in snow, and we were flown by a Polish crew, a liberator of a Polish squadron, and they were so excited at finding themselves over their native country that instead of dropping us from six or eight hundred feet, it was a night drop, they dropped us from about three hundred, and our parachutes barely had time to open. And we landed on this frozen plough land, which was like almost like landing on concrete, and we were all, fortunately, minor injuries, but we were all injured. I couldn't walk properly for two days and had to be carried on a farm cart, and Bill Hudson concussed himself. Um, but if, I, if the, the, the Germans had a small force nearby, and luckily they weren't uh, alerted in time, we were able to get away. But if it had come to a running fight, I should have been lost. Um, anyway, we were received by the Poles with enormous enthusiasm. Here I'd better go back a bit, because I'd better explain what our mission now was. Yes. Warsaw having fallen, there was no question of sending us there. And I suppose I should be thankful that we didn't drop there, because I doubt if we'd have survived. Our job now was we were dropped into southwestern Poland, near in a triangle between Czastochowa, Kielce, and uh, in southwestern Poland, near uh, uh, the nearest uh, town was a place called Radomsko, not all that far from Czastochowa. And uh, our mission was, strictly speaking, and in, uh, strictly, our instructions were very strict on this point, that it, the on New Year's Day, we got surprised, taken by surprise. The Germans had discovered where we were. We were in a, a farmhouse, really, I suppose you'd call it. And we were woke. I was the first one to, to wake up. It was very, very, it was first light. And we, it was New Year's Day, and for some reason we had not followed our usual routine and gone with the pole, with our Polish escort, into the fields. We were in this house. We thought we were safe, I suppose. All the Poles who were looking after us thought we were safe. Anyway, I heard the sound of tank engines, and so I immediately roused the others, and we prepared to get underway. Well, the Germans were very much closer than we realized. There were four medium tanks, which carried us, each of which I suppose carried a 75-millimeter gun. I'm not very good on armor. Um, and four lorry loads of infantry. And there was a... Uh, wood of saplings nearby, which did provide cover. And while we got away, and we had these very strict orders that we were not to get involved in operations, and the Poles had them too, and so they insisted that we, that we, should, we should leave them to do the fighting. And one Bren gunner held up those four lorry loads of infantry and four tanks. He got absolutely shot to pieces, but he, we, we got away, and, and most of, the, of, of our escort got away. Most of our accompanying Poles got away, too. Um, it was an, a horrible experience, but for sheer courage, I've never seen anything like it. Mm. You said that the signals you sent back didn't, in fact, get through. Well, I never discovered why that was, but um, when we got back to London, we found that a lot of the signals we'd sent, I don't think I can say all of them, but a lot of them, had not arrived, had not been received. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why that was. Our own, after that episode on New Year's Day, of course, we were entirely dependent on Polish links because we lost our, we had to leave our, our wireless, our radios, um, uh, behind in the farmhouse because mm. they were far too heavy to carry in a hurry. Mm. Um, yes, you're going to tell me about the prison in... Yes. Well, when the Russians overran the part of Poland where we were in their great offensive from the Vistula to the Oda, um, they overran our 
part, uh, the part where we were, and we had instructions, which one of the signals we did receive, to hand ourselves over to the nearest uh, Russian divisional headquarters, <coughs> which was, we, we found out where they were without too much difficulty, and we expected, as allies, a warm and friendly reception with lots of vodka and caviar. We got something very different. We got uh, a reception from the NKVD, which today would be called the KGB, and we were put into a very unpleasant prison in Chastahova, which the NKVD had taken over about 48 hours earlier from the Gestapo. And we were in a filthy cell, six of us, because by that time we had a Polish laser officer with us and we, we managed to get him. Um... Yes, I gave you the wrong figures. I said uh, that there was Bill Hudson, Peter Solly Flood, myself and Galbraith, but there was also um, a, a Polish speaker who went under the name of Curry. He was, I think, uh, born and brought up in Poland. But... Um, and we had this, the, the Army Krajowa liaison officer with us. So there were six of us, and there, there were th three bunks on each side of this, of this filthy cell with straw, very dirty straw. I've never had so many different forms of animal life on my body as I did by the time I came out of that. And we had nothing to eat. They gave us a small piece of bread and some warm water with a few grains of barley floating in it um, uh, each day. Uh, they had a, there was a bright bulb, a naked bulb, shining in the cell day and night, which didn't make it easy to sleep. They took all our books and everything away from us, but for some extraordinary reason, they left us two packs of cards. And we played bridge solidly. We, four of us would play bridge and the other two would sleep, day and night, uh, for all that month that we were there. I've never played bridge since, but it certainly <laughs> kept us sane. They would use, used to come and haul us out from time to time, or rather they used to come and haul Bill Hudson out, in, chiefly in the middle of the night, or at any time of day or night, to ask him stupid questions like, what was our wavelength to London, and who did we, co and who did we communicate with in London? And Bill took a very good attitude indeed. He, he said, this is a disgraceful way to treat allies. We are in uniform, we have identity cards. I am, I am a full colonel, and I am not going to talk to any Russian officer under the rank of full colonel. So every time they wanted to interrogate him, they had to find somebody and dress him up as a full colonel, <laughs> uh, which was very effective. It's the sort of thing the Russians understood. If we'd sort of cringed and and uh, um, and, and been, been, been tried to be nice to them, we'd have had, I think, a worse time still. Mm. And uh, anyway, after a while, I suppose when... I think they were keeping us on ice until after the Yalta decisions had been made. But eventually they... Um, put us in an aeroplane and flew us to Kiev and then put us in a train, an um, overnight journey to Moscow, um, and handed us over to the British military mission, who were so sorry for us that I at least more nearly died from alcoholic poisoning in the le next two weeks than I ever did from enemy action. And then they flew us out via Baku and Tehran to and Cairo back to England. Uh, one thing you said the other day was that you remarked on the fact that there were no Polish Quislings. That's quite true. As far as I know, there were none at all. Um, certain writers who ought to know better, novelists, have talked about uh, Polish SS divisions. There was no such thing. Mm. The Pol mm. how, how much could SOE do to help them? N no more than it did. Uh, it did all it possibly could do. Which was... Dropping in supplies, dropping in, you know, dropping in uh, Polish uh, reinforcements, I suppose you'd call them, for the army of Krajowa. Um, arms and supplies and, and food. Mm. And I suppose... Help help sorry. At considerable risk, I may say, to the RAF pilots and air crew who did it. Mm. And they did take quite severe casualties. Mm. And 
training to some extent, I suppose? Or... Oh, the training, yes, was done in England. There were poles at the various parachute and other training uh, stations of SOE um, throughout the country, throughout England, I think, throughout Britain. Sorry. Yeah. You, you did mention the other day, and so actually did um, somebody who Penny was talking to, a pole himself, that uh, things like the rocket launchers, were they, that were dropped in? Um, well, I would. I honestly didn't come across that, and I don't know anything about it. I mean, it's well known that the, it was through the poles that we discovered the V1, but I'm afraid I can't give you any accurate information on that because, first of all, Penamunda was the other end of the country. <coughs> it was right in the north, and I, we were in the south. And uh, all I know about it is what I've read. Mm. No, I think I, may have, I think I may have confused you or used the wrong term. I was thinking that some of the uh, weapons that were dropped in couldn't actually be used more than, say, once because there wasn't the ammunition. I'm so afraid I, I don't know no, anything no, about that. No, well, I can, I can check that. Um, and I, I just wanted to ask you generally about the Home Army and what it achieved. I mean, it was obviously the most tremendous organisation. Oh, it was, and it... Um, uh, as I say, it, it controlled the country to the extent that the um, Germans, of course, controlled the towns and the main routes. <laughs> but at night country belonged to the army, army of Craiova, as I've already said, and during daylight we were able to move around the countryside, mm. although with considerable care, because they had some of Vlasov's uh, Cossack, uh, General Vlasov, the um, Red Army General who defected to the Germans, and, and some of his army, and, and they, from all I heard of them, I never, thank God, came very close to them, but I, I think they were I understand they were they were pretty brutal. Mm. So and this was happening. <coughs> this was happening ev even after the Warsaw Rising when. So oh, certainly, yes, because mm. it went on until right until the Russians overran the whole country. Mm. So in fact, they were they must have been holding down and considerably harassing a great number of German troops. I don't know the uh, about how many they were holding holding down because of course the Germans had considerable forces uh, facing the Russians on the on the Vistula, when. <laughs> when we arrived, <laughs> uh, but they were certainly harassing them. <coughs> um, can you tell me something about the work you did in Thailand? Yes, well, I was on I only arrived there at the very end of the war. Um, I was dropped in from a place, an airfield near Calcutta. Um, it was a daylight drop, evening drop, and we took off. Uh, in a liberator, um, my companion was uh, Rowley Wynn, Rowley St. Oswald, as he is now, and uh, we had two NCOs um, who were uh, a wireless operator and demolitions expert for Rowley. I didn't have any um, staff of my own. <coughs> I wasn't feeling very good because I had malaria and dysentery. Um, but a uh, very good, a very nice doctor in, at the air, airfield in Calcutta filled me up with sulfagranadine. And really, bless his heart, laced me with brandy, from Napoleon brandy, which he'd brought with him specially to celebrate his landing, all the way over. So I didn't feel a lot of pain. Um, we um, had no problem in finding the... We had to fly a long way over Burma and over a lot of Thailand because we were being dropped right in the northeast of Thailand, uh, almost by the Mekong River, which is the frontier between Thailand and what was then French Indochina. And um, I remember one incident. Um, we uh, we would dro somebody had invented a new way of dropping out of a liberator. Instead of just dropping through the hole in the fuselage in the bottom of the fuselage, they the, the, there was a a sort of shoot like a, those things in children's playgrounds that you sit on and shoot and, and slide down. I don't know why they thought it was better than going out of the hole direct, but anyway, this was the, the arrangement. And you had to, when the red light went on for action stations, you got onto this shoot thing, gripping the sides with your hands, and when the green light went on, you 
clasped your hands across your chest, and that meant with your own weight carried you down and through the hole. And really, I, I, I was um, um, really it always he had a very light-hearted view of life, and, and, and uh, um, well, we were. under the command of David Smiley, who, of course, I'd known in Albania, and um, really had known, too, very well. And he was uh, in charge of our party, and he sent Rowley up to uh, up to the north, to a place called Nong Kai on the Mekong, which is almost opposite Vientiane, the Laotian capital today. And he sent me to a place called Nakhon Panom, which is almost opposite Takek, another village in... French Indochina, or as it is today Laos. Perhaps I should say as it is today Vietnam. Um, and uh, our job was really to help get French refugees out of those towns, and in fact out of all Indochina, uh, out of all, sorry, out of all the that province of Indochina, um, because they were in a terrible way after the Japanese, the Japanese in March up till March, I think the French had, in Indochina had been treated rather like Vichy France. And then the Japanese suddenly struck in March, early in March, and killed all the men they could find and imprisoned the women and children. And a lot of them were in a very bad way in Takek, Savannaket, further south, and, of course, in Vientiane. And there were a few French officers with some Laotian irregulars holding out in the jungle against the Vietnamese, against the Viet Minh, the communist Vietnamese. And our job was to help them as much as we possibly could, as well as the refugees. And that involved night journeys across the river uh, with arms and food and medicines. When the Japanese surrendered, uh, I should add, David Smiley was stationed fur much further south of Dubon, which is quite a large town and was the railhead. And he was dealing with the disarming of the... This was after the Japanese surrender, with the disarming of the Japanese um, uh, troops down there because they had a, quite a large garrison there. Um, the... Um, yes, yes, what happened after the Japanese surrendered, they quite wrongly handed over their arms to the Viet Minh, the communist Vietnamese, and they said that they were going to guard the French refugees. Well, naturally, the, the, the refugees were terrified. And it was our job to persuade the Japanese, who still had arms, to help us get these people out. And we were, in fact, able to do so, both Rowley and I. Um, the, um, switch. And that was really the, the main work that I was doing. We, it was... It was interesting and quite exciting, these night trips in small dugout canoes across the Mekong. We had local pilots and boatmen to help, uh, help us. We were carrying our load of arms, and um, well, we, sometimes, we, we sometimes got fired on by the, by the Viet Minh. But uh, the French were very, very grateful, at least they were, certainly said they were very, very grateful. And then um, later on... Uh, David Smiley and Rowley Wynn went back, back to England, and I was left in charge of the whole area, which is about 50,000 square miles, and about 400, more than 400 miles of, of, of river frontier. And then I, I had an airfield. It wasn't really an airfield. It was, it was a, a field, but it, 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 you could land planes, uh, light aircraft on it, and you could uh, use it as a dropping zone. And they dropped in um, quite a number of parachutists, um, Foreign Legion and, well, from the Army Colonial uh, into me, and I, my job was to get them over the river. So uh, it was an interesting time, but it wasn't strictly SOE work. Mm -hmm. And then eventually, at the beginning of 1946, after the peace treaty between Great Britain and Siam, as it then was, had been signed, they decided to, quite naturally to close down my missions. And so... I left that part of the world. I left uh, um, uh, that part of Thailand and went down to Bangkok, where I was given the most marvellous job I think the army has ever given anyone. I had to liberate and then govern the island of Bali. Oh, 
Peter, I never knew that. <laughs> I think we leave it at that. <laughs> oh, well, I have to ask you more about well, that. Well, it's nothing to do with SOE. <laughs> Oh, what a shame. Well, you, you'll have to tell me more <laughs> on oh, another that occasion. Yes, yes, it? I just wanted to ask, um, I mean, everybody in SOE was doing difficult work and most people <laughs> were doing dangerous work. Were, 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 were there any people who were doing particularly dangerous work, do you think? What were the nastiest jobs? That's difficult to answer. Um, Certainly not my jobs, the jobs I did, certainly not. Um, I suppose the people in France must have had a dreadful time. And I think the people in Burma, in the, you know, when, when, when the war, the Japanese war was, was, was uh, um, uh, at, uh, at its height. Uh, but I'm afraid I can't tell you anything about that because I was neither in France nor in Burma. Uh, but but why the why the people in France particularly? Well, I, because the, the uh, I imagine because the Germans I wasn't there, but I imagine because the Germans were so thick on the ground, um, you couldn't except in the marquee areas you couldn't wear uniform. I imagine, and you had to be bilingual in French, and you had to, I mean, be prepared to pass the most rigorous uh, security checks at any moment. And I would have thought the strain on the nerves there was absolutely appalling. Mm. Perhaps I ought to add to that that I think possibly the most dangerous, because hardly anybody survived it, were, was uh, the um, e were SOE operations in uh, Indonesia, uh, as it then was, well, I'm thinking particularly of Java and Sumatra, because there was a hostile population there, and uh, so many of our people, from all I hear, were given away by the locals to the Japanese. I don't no, whether I'm right in saying nobody survived it, but a hell of a lot of people didn't, and more didn't than did. Mm. Mm.